Um, I'd like to exempt myself from the Chairman's kind offer of protection. Uh, you don't have to demonstrate Southern courtesy to me. I've had enough of it uh, all day. Um, everyone's been almost stupefyingly uh, polite and gentle with me. So if anyone wants to get rough, they might find that I was ready to play. There must be something very persuasive about those who put this meeting together because they maybe break two of my usual rules. One is not to enter a house of worship without wearing a vast necklace of garlic around my neck. <laughs> and the other is to do no work, no labor of any kind on the International Day of the Working Class May Day. <laughs> so you maybe break two for a start. Uh, but hey, that's what commandments are for. Um, the stuff that's in the Ten Commandments, Dinesh, um, that isn't to do with human morality is often highly immoral. For example, it's forbidden even to covet uh, other people's goods or achievements. And by the way, among their goods are included their wives, their womenfolk who are lumped in with chattel, which goes to show that these commandments are created by men and not by gods. They're created by the agricultural and, and masculine values of the time. It's not a small point, but there's nothing uh, for example, to condemn the abuse of children. There's only a vague demand that parents be respected. After all, this is coming from, apparently, a father. There's nothing against racism. There's nothing against slavery. There's nothing against genocide. Partly because in these and ensuing chapters, all those things, racism, genocide, slavery, are actually going to be not just recommended, but enjoined, made an actual injunction on the children of Israel. They're going to be told to do these things. Uh, so, it seems to me very obvious that, the, that what is known as religious morality is partly man-made and it shows. It shows that it's made by a, a greedy and cruel, partly evolved, fairly highly evolved, let's not run ourselves down too much, primate species that turns out on examination to be, as we now know, one half chromosome away from a chimpanzee. If I'm, if I'm supposed to cross-examine, I should do that rather than rebut. Four. Don't think right, I've run right. out of things to no, say. No. Just, I'm just recovering from the amount of applause for Christianity I just heard from the <laughs> pews. Um, <laughs> perhaps it was just making nice, I don't know. Um, why don't I do a bit of cross-examination yes, and see how it goes? Someone will have to be a timekeeper. Right here. And my first, I'm told my first is to Dennis, and I think I'll begin by asking him if he would care to specify for me the secular roots of anti-Semitism and fascism the founding movement of totalitarianism. I'm taking you up on your point about secular totalitarianism being as bad as religious. Given that there was the no... Origin, the original totalitarian movement, the movement that invented the term in the 20th century, fascism, is, if you look at any history, I'll just make this observation, any history of the, uh, the mid-20th century, take out the word fascism, put in the Catholic right wing, nothing changes, right? Whether it's the history of Spain or Croatia or Hungary, I want to know where the secular roots of uh, anti-Semitism and fascism are, in your opinion. Yeah. Well, or, I, I, I actually, I'd rather I, have evidence than opinion okay. for a uh, change. Just bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, if you do want things to get a little warm later on, that I, for one, will take it as extremely insulting if any person of faith makes the assumption that their faith gives them a moral edge on me. I want to hear a lot more apologizing from the faith-based communities for the evil that they've done before they even start clearing their throats and telling me I wouldn't know right from wrong without their permission. I'm sorry, I won't be, can't be spoken to in that tone of voice and nor should any of you. Today, you did say that this was a secular movement. I did say what was a you secular movement. You said that fascism and Nazism were secular. Yes, movement. they are indeed. The, well, I said that, I, actually, I said communism I and Nazism. I, I said communism and Nazism. I was trying to, get you to, trying to get you to acknowledge the utter falsity of what you'd said. The, the what of and what the, I said? There's a problem trying, with these sounds back here. I have also in getting you to say that it is utterly false. The, uh, the, the origins of the organizing principle of that movement, Jew-hating, are not secular. They yes, are, you're they absolutely are, they right. Are, they are religious because they are, they, the, they, they are in the religion that half the people in this room yeah, just applaud. Well, then give me the secular roots of the Ten Commandments. It's just as silly a question. There, there, there is no secular roots when there is no secularism, but today in America, almost all the anti-Semitism comes from the secular left. 
So, so it's, it's a very poor argument I on your – where you there will, is religion in I America and there is secularism, the anti-Semitism is overwhelmingly oh, like no. at UC Irvine next week from the secular left. Now, I'm just very sorry to have to tell you that um, I, I think that now you may have perhaps exhausted the extreme tolerance for other people's religions that uh, – as the Catholic anti-Semitism that I've just been specifying in this room. If, if anyone who doesn't know where anti-Semitism is being pumped out – in the modern world, in this room, I'd be very surprised I mean, if, the, if it isn't pretty well understood that the, the revival of the protocols of the elders of Zion comes from the Hamas website. Yes, of course it does. Comes from another they're monotheism. Not, they're not in the United States. Another they're in the monotheism that correctly claims kinship with Christianity and Judaism. It's the, the origins of anti-Semitism. Uh, are, are entirely okay. in other monotheisms. I mean, if anyone doesn't know that... Yes, they are. You they are. A single, if you find me a single, a single text of the secular left that, uh, that licenses anti-Semitism, I should be very surprised. And I challenge you to do so. Well, uh, sure, I'll, but, I'll be but happy. But I also, I would invite you to stop exculpating. At all, at I'm not very exculpating. Least to stop making excuses for right. the actual practitioners of anti-Semitism, the Catholic and Islamic right wing. On with the false picture of reality. Religion has its grandeur, the reason why this discussion is always so interesting, always so worth having. The magnificence of religion comes from the fact that it was first. It was our first attempt. It's our first attempt to make sense of the cosmos, our first cosmology, our first attempt at philosophy. In many ways, and in some of the books, our first attempt at literature and, and poetry. Um, in some ways, our first attempt at, at, at medicine, even at physics, uh, at all the sciences and some of the arts, this was humanity's first fumbling attempt to look at the sky and see uh, where it fitted in. Uh, all credit to religion for trying this. Someone had to. Um, but it, because it was the first, it was also, is also in many ways the worst. What happens when you don't have a germ theory of disease and you wonder where the plagues are coming from? Well, you either think they're a punishment from God or you think, depending on how far we've gone along into the medieval years of religion, they come from the Jews poisoning the wells, or from witchcraft, or from people not going to their prayers enough. The same about natural phenomena, like earthquakes or floods. Um, there must be a supernatural explanation for things that, of course, we now know, uh, can be much better and more accurately explained for us. So the fact that we are still burdened by the false picture given of reality and of nature by religion is, I think, not the, not the smallest of the indictments against it. You still hear at times like Katrina or the, or the Pacific tsunami, you will still hear men of religion, including in civilized and advanced and educated countries such as, the, such as England. The, the bishop saying, this is because of sin, that there is an inundation. And out of this, it seems to me again, we must teach ourselves uh, as developed humans, evolving humans to grow. But you'll, you'll admit that for me, I mean, who does say to anyone who asks exactly what he thinks, and when, you, when I say well, I'm an atheist, you can pretty much tell what I'm going to say and what I'm going to stand by. It's disappointing every time I ask a religious person to find that they're, they're shopping from some clerical cafeteria. I like this bit, I don't like that bit. To be a Roman Catholic is supposed to mean that you say that all other forms of religion are false. I don't, is, think, I don't think it does. First of all, I think that's flatly untrue, worth, Christopher. It's worth, it's worth, uh, pointing, it's worth not only, not that, only is what, that is what Holy Mother Church actually says. I'm saying this for this reason. There's a lot of soft ecumenicism in the air tonight, and there's a lot of soft ecumenicism in the audience tonight. I just feel a few tough distinctions are worth making. Well, people let's who make really, them. People who really make their, take their, their church seriously, particularly Holy Mother Church, say, it's a pity. You're wasting your time. Your religion is worthless to you. It's not going to get oh. you to heaven. It's not going to redeem you. It's not going to save you. Only, there's only one way of doing that. Now, that surely has to be counted also as among the beliefs that we're discussing. Well, first of all... Wouldn't you say yes to that? <laughs> the great thing about being religious is this. When the evidence against you becomes overwhelming, and you can see the amazing intricacies of the Big Bang, and the extraordinary... Uh, matter of the Hubble red light shift and the things we can now see through uh, Mr. Hubble's telescope and when you see the extraordinary variety of species religion says ah oh, come to think of it that is true in fact it shows that God was even more ingenious than we had thought him in the first place what's my objection to this kind of argument well the, of, of the many I could make the first is simply this it's completely impossible to refute 
because every time any new evidence comes to light, it's, all, it's claimed for, well, we, it fits with, what, with, the, with the unoverthrowable theory that we already had. Uh, some of you will have been taught already, I hope, that, that uh, a theory that can be described as unfalsifiable is to that extent a very weak theory. And that seems to me to apply with overwhelming force to the religious or, or, or godly explanation of our presence here and the natural phenomena um, around us. Uh, every thinking believer has doubts. Do you ever doubt your atheism? Well, the, uh, the practice, the atheist, <coughs> secularist, materialist practice is based on doubt. No, you're not answering my question. Do, well, you, ever that, doubt, do um, you ever doubt atheism? I sometimes doubt God's existence. Do you ever doubt God's non-existence? No. Okay. That is exactly a perfect example. I, I mean, I try. It is a perfect... I try, but I yes, can't succeed. Uh, 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 I, I do my best. I, I mean, well, you don't I give try it, hard I give enough. It a, I give it a try, but, okay. but it's... Right. It's not possible to... Um, I know, I know. I, well, that, that is... Look, I, I appreciate your honesty because... I think you, I'm here you, myself because of the laws of biology okay. and not because of a divine plan. I just haven't got right. the arrogance to claim that I'm here because God has a plan for me. On the Most of the tyrannies under which humans have labored in the past and continue to labor under in the present have in their essence been theocratic. Because once you can give to any other group of mammals and primates any other group of humans who are essentially no better than you, the right to say that they speak in God's name, that they know God's will, that they have God's authority and God's permission, then there is no limit to the kind of totalitarian misery that can be inflicted on you um, in the real world, in the very few years of existence and life and potential freedom that we absolutely know for a sure thing we do have, that are not part of the metaphysic, but that are our common property, are our birthright. And this has been true since the, the, early, uh, the early theocratic uh, tyrannies of the Aztecs, the Babylonians, through to the idea of the tyrannies of feudalism and monarchism against which the American Revolution was mounted, to many, many of the terrible 20th century tyrannies, fascism, Hitlerism, the South African system of apartheid, which was a, a branch entirely of the Dutch uh, Reformed Church and its belief that there was a divine mission on their side, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is shortly to get its own apocalyptic and Armageddon weapon and other threats which make me think, and I'll, I'll rest my case here and wait for rebuttal, make me think that the battle against the religious illusion is part of a very important battle, not just for human emancipation, but actually potentially, if not really imminently, uh, also for human survival, and therefore a battle that we dare not lose. Thank you. There's nothing hypothetical about the last question I was asked when it, when it finally came to a question um, because it was the fate of many, many uh, Jewish people in Europe to have to wonder to whom they could turn um, in their time of extremity. And I'll tell you the place they didn't turn, which was the, to the churches that had made the official concordat with Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. The churches that had told their parties to vote for him in the, in the Reichstag the church that had told, especially the Catholic Church, that had told its, its bishops to celebrate Adolf Hitler's birth day every year from the pulpit, which they did till April 1945, uh, which had preached the anti-Semitism on which the Nazi party based itself, which uh, in many cases violated the seal of the confessional to turn over resistors, um, and in all cases turned over the birth records of the parishes of uh, Bavaria and the rest of Germany so that the Nuremberg laws could be enforced and everyone with even a particle of Jewish blood could be identified, set aside for deportation and persecution. Anyone who doesn't know this doesn't know anything about it. Not only that, not one person was excommunicated or threatened with excommunication by the church for taking part in the final solution. Paul Johnson, a Roman Catholic historian, estimates that 40 to 50 percent of the Waffen SS were confessing, communicating Roman Catholics. Not one of them was ever threatened with the smallest punishment for what they did or were doing. Thank you. Uh, but, um, no, don't, don't, let's give up. It doesn't mean that there's no relationship between Christianity and morality in this dark hour. Joseph Goebbels was expelled, was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. He was. Why? Do you know why? For marrying a Protestant. Magda Goebbels was a Protestant and a divorcee. Joseph Goebbels 
had the sacraments withdrawn from him. That's the only case I know of a Nazi being threatened with discipline by the Roman Catholic Church. To dare to ask me that question in that tone of voice in this audience, I think, shows something, uh, something really like uh, moral irresponsibility. But that's my reply, and that's the short version. Okay, try me on this again, and on the relationship between faith and totalitarianism, and I have a lot more for you. Okay, so just keep trying. Of course, but I don't actually think that loving your enemy is always a moral injunction. Um, there are some enemies I don't love, and I don't think I should. I, it's not my right for people who might want to kill you and your children, or kill my children. It's not my right to love these people. It's my duty to destroy them, to defeat them. There's nothing moral about saying, let them have their way, turn the other cheek. That would simply be uh, my political, my secular, rather than my, my theological view. But I do think there is a problem with, with the rest of what Dinesh said on this point. Um, the, the other injunctions about love, and we, we'll stay just with Christianity for the moment. A problem I always had with it was, was compulsory love. Not you're compelled to love your neighbor, or even not just to love him, but to remember to love him or her as you love yourself, an injunction that actually cannot be obeyed. Nobody with any integrity and self-respect can have the same regard for another person as he has for himself and perhaps his family. It's not to be expected. It's more than can be demanded. It's a work of super erogation. And it has the sinister corollary that because you know you can never quite do it, you're always falling short. You must always flagellate yourself for failing to come up to this magnificent idea. You're always going to be guilty again. You can't possibly be right. You're always in a state of sin. And this has the connotation again uh, of the totalitarian, a, a, a law you cannot obey. Further, you're supposed to return this love to someone who is your creator. And you're told in addition to being compelled to love this person, you must also fear him. Is there not a problematic element here? Compulsory love for a being, a supreme being, of whom he must also at all times always be in fear. When I think of this, the image I get is of George Orwell's big brother in 1984, where adoration is extracted from people who are in a state of holy terror. It doesn't seem like morality to me. Now, the golden, the so-called golden rule um, that we should have the same consideration for others that we expect them to have for us is a very fine rule in its way. It has a limitation I'm about to mention, it's a, but it's a decent enough rule. And, it long pre and it's not hysterical, and it's not totalitarian, and it doesn't demand the impossible of people. Don't do to another what would, be, what would be repulsive if they did it to you. We know that that was said by Rabbi Hillel long before Christianity, Babylonian rabbi. Something almost exactly in that form of words also appears in the Analects of Confucius. So it predates monotheism altogether. Some such idea is obviously innate to us. It's commonsensical. The limitation, I'll just mention it conversationally, is it's a rule that's only really as good as the person who's uttering it. The person who's uttering it must be a person of average moral character because there are many people... Uh, I'll, let me think of an example. Well, Ch Charles Manson, for example. It, it's ludicrous for me to say of him that I don't want anything done to him I wouldn't want done to myself. Obviously, I want different things to happen to Charles Manson. I don't judge it by what I think I'm entitled to. So the rule is in danger of becoming tautologous and of breaking down. And that's why I don't think that there are, in that sense, religious or moral absolutes. Um, and why it's, it never makes any sense to say that we wouldn't know right from wrong if we couldn't refer it upwards to the unseen celestial core. There will always, unfortunately, be uh, ethical and moral approximations, and that's part of the curse of our mammalian condition. But just as I wrote a book about the Parthenon, for example, and think it should be regarded as a great temple of our civilization, and a great, uh, as fifth century Athens was a great flourishing of it, but I don't agree with the cult of Pallas Athena, I don't agree with the uh, Athenian imperialism in Mytilene and Sparta. I don't agree with the Eleusinian mysteries and the, and the, the various dark uh, cults that disfigured. Uh, okay, but it's quite possible to have the one, the glory, the architecture, the culture, the symmetry, the poetry, and the music without the superstition. I, I, in fact, I would define the cultural task of agnosticism and atheism as being uh, the recognition of the numinous and the transcendent uh, while repudiating the superstitious and the supernatural. 
But if it was the case that a belief in Jupiter or Zeus or Diana inspired the Parthenon, it would actually be simply wrong and in fact historically narrow-minded to say that the Greek myths poisoned everything. Clearly they had an enormously beneficial impact because they did inspire those people who built those buildings. So unless you're claiming... We can't, we can't know that. Well, two things. One, we can't know that the belief in these uh, cults was sincerely affirmed rather than coerced. Are but you that's maintaining the that? Thing, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, if you grant this, Dinesh, if you want me to grant it, then you too have to say, well, as you very perilously have just already come close to saying, that any religion is as good as any other. You can go to heaven. Who cares that Jesus said you can only come to the Father by me? It doesn't well, matter. You're, you're, you're just shifting be, ground on me. No, 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 no. And, saying and that you have to say that the Aztecs... You're and implying you have to say preposterous. That the people, no, you're implying you preposterously. You have to say that the people who built the hideous uh, temples based on human sacrifice everywhere from Cambodia to Mexico uh, have just as good a claim to be the founders of our civilization. I'm sure you don't mean to make such an idiotic uh, statement. Well, you that, um, I've, I see no reason to believe in the existence of any supernatural dimension, either cosmologically or, or on Earth or in human life. I can, I can live without it, and in fact, I think everyone does live without it, whether they believe in it or not. You clearly don't think that, but you also think that uh, Salvation is attainable by this. It's not just a matter of proving that there might be a supernatural dimension, but that if you believe in it in the right way, your sins can be forgiven, you can be saved, and you can have an afterlife, a blissful one, that will go on forever. Now, don't you think that's quite a high burden of proof? Given the number of gods that have been, you, you touched on, you even named some of them, Baal, Dagon, um, Thor, Artemis, anyone could come up with quite a long list. H.L. Mencken once got the list up to something like 10,000, the gods that we know have been worshipped. It seems to me that we have three possible alternatives. Think, let's not even say possible, thinkable alternatives. One, that all of these are false. In other words, that the proposition um, God made man in his own image is exactly the wrong way around. Instead, men made many gods in their own image. Um, so either they're all false or they're all true, which as I say is only just thinkable because it's obviously nonsensical, or only one of them is true. And actually if you chose that to be Christianity, you'd have to say, if you're a real Christian, it seems to me only one version of that Christianity is true because many of those are mutually incompatible. Now do you really think, given the odds and given the scope and the scale of it, that the third answer can be the correct one? Will you admit then that this analogy is specious and that in fact there are fundamental differences between Christianity and Islam that the new atheists have been exploiting to in a sense transfer no. the guilt of Islamic no. radicalism onto Christianity? If you had asked me in the 1930s which religious belief I thought was the most threatening to the survival of human society and civilization, I would have said Roman Catholicism because of its very intimate and deep and nasty relationship with fascism. At that stage, the, the greatest threat to the humanity was not jihadism, but at present it is. Religions take their turn at bat. Um, in Northern Ireland, um, Protestantism has been far more oppressive okay. and, and obscurantist than Catholicism even for the last uh, half century. I would regard that as anomalous, but there's no way, just as you can't answer my question about why in that case don't you credit the builders of mosques and Aztec temples and, uh, uh, and Khmer uh, uh, temples too, and say that all of, all of these prove that religion is the origin of civilization. You won't do that because it would be too ecumenical for you. Human efforts to reach the supernatural, the fact that you've got so many efforts shows that it's quite likely that some efforts are closer than others. It's sort of like a, a way of saying, we're all trying to get up to the light up there. There are going to be different attempts, different uh, theories for how to do it, uh, but, but some of them may approximate better than others. But, uh, Jeanette, and one sure. might actually be the closest. But surely that's not really an analogy in conflicting accounts of observable natural phenomena. Right? He's saying, where, where, what, what are the constituent elements of matter? We can see that nature is here. Is it all water? Is it all air? Is it phlogiston? Is it atoms? That's completely different from saying, whose god are you going to worship? And by the way, scientists do not kill each other for getting, uh, diff coming up with different interpretations, nor do they sentence other people to eternal paradise or torment for getting it right or wrong. Religion is something else than an opinion. I hope you'll agree. It is, but let's, it's let's, a faith. let's look at that. It's if, a faith with a big promise attached to it. 
And isn't the core principle of Christianity that God offers his love to us? Christ died for our sins, but there's nothing compulsory about it. It's completely a free choice. You have a free choice. No one's forcing you. You've chosen to reject it, but nobody made you. Well, you can, you can of course, you're, one, you're free to reject it. But I'm here to illustrate that point to the best of my ability. But in a very large number of times and places, the price of rejecting it, or even of seeming to reject it, has been very high. And not just in the sense of eternal punishment after death, but extreme punishment and persecution during the only life one actually has. So I'm thankful, I'm very grateful to you naturally for giving me uh, my manumission. Um, but I don't actually think I need your permission to be free on this point. Or the permission from the divine either. That's being unfree. It's like saying, of course, there's, if you ask me, have we got free will, I, I say yes. Of course we have. We have no choice. At least I know I'm being ironic. And the irony is somewhat at my expense. But if you say, of course we have free will because the boss says we do, you've advanced the argument not at all. It's, it's analogous to that. So my question is, if Socrates existed by accepted canons of historical scholarship, uh, on what basis do you deny the historicity, forget the divinity, just the historicity of Christ? Well, you only had to turn another page and to see that I say that uh, there's no proof of the existence of Socrates either. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Dinesh, you what only, about you, Alexander you, the Great? You only did he have, exist? You only have to turn another page to see my say in my discussion of Athenian uh, philosophy that there's no proof of the existence of Socrates either. I, I, make, I make the point almost as you do. I say it's with, with the exception of two people who were admirers, we, don't, we can't be certain that he existed at all, but it doesn't make any difference. Christopher because virtually... the Socratic, I can, I can revere the Socratic method without having any need at all to deify or, or uh, put on a pedestal, uh, 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 make superhuman, uh, the person who invented it. No, the point so I'm making I'm is... I'm sorry you've just dug a pit, not the first time this evening, you've just dug a pit for yourself with your own hands. All I can ask people to do is one by one for themselves, to emancipate themselves from this primitive belief, and for societies one by one, as many have, to put at least the theocratic phase behind them and build up a wall of separation between religion and politics. And that's what I'm here to do. It's ingenious, but it doesn't allow for the retarding effect upon human civilization of superstition, slavery, genocide, human sacrifice, religious warfare, uh, resistance to scientific um, and medical advance and so forth, all of which can be uh, chalked up uh, with a great deal more accuracy, I might add, to the religious worldview. Okay. And which now, now that we're about to reach the point where apocalyptic weaponry is within the grasp of messianic parties and states, um, they may find that it's uh, extremely counter-survival um, in, in a very alarming and immediate sense. You would nowhere there's no, apply there's, there is no to evidence, any other figure. There is no evidence but the hearsay of fans. I want to switch For to the Dennis Prager and Jesus my... Of Nazareth. Alexander the Great at least has coins with his face on them. <laughs> I'm going to put one quick question. And name. One question to Dennis Prager, if Written I may. Written down by literate people. There's nothing of that for Jesus or Moses. Christopher, you are engaging in the filibuster. <laughs> All right. Um, no, answering the question, I think, otherwise you could have accused me of not doing so. There is no evidence of any kind for the existence of Moses or Jesus, none at all, of the kind that there is for Alexander the Great. Not to know the difference is well, not to know say, the difference. Let's just say that... I wouldn't say that atheism was a morally superior position. I wouldn't say it was a morally inferior one, certainly. But th there's a tiny edge that it might possess, and it's this. We can't be accused of wishful thinking at all. We, we will accept conclusions that may be unwelcome to us. We don't say, well, I, I, I won't believe this because if I did, it would mean I'd have to be a pessimist. I mean, that would be absurd. It would be counter-intellectual. Um, I'm not particularly delighted at the thought of my own biological annihilation of my returning to atoms. It does, doesn't delight me. My conclusion is it's the overwhelmingly probable thing that the likelihood that I'll be reassembled and we'll have this discussion again in some theme park is vanishingly small. And if you want to... Uh, reintroduce the question of hope. No, I don't like the idea that at a certain point I'll be tapped on the shoulder and told you have to leave the party now and you can't come back. And not only that, it's going to go on without you. I don't particularly like that thought, but I think it will happen. On the other hand, if you replace it with the thought the party's going to go on forever and daddy will be watching you 
at it all the time and you can never leave if you find hope in that I wish you joy of it but that there is so much injustice and that there is so much random misery and unfairness is not my problem it is the problem for those who say and I'll, I'll rest on this those who look, at, who look at the idea of a God and who say a God who would make a penis that needs to be snipped, it's so badly thought out. Some designer, the word for this, was, this phrase for this was come, it was, it was come up with by the great poet Fulk Greville a um, long time ago. He said, if you believe this, then you believe that we are created sick and then ordered to be well. That can only be done by a heartless, cruel, incompetent designer. Voilà.